Uh, I have a guest now, the beloved Catherine Courier, who was former director of libraries at the UW two-year campus at Rice Lake. And she's going to be reading from something I wrote originally probably 45 years ago, and it sat in various formats. And it's called The Saga of Evil Igor. And it's about a love affair between a Byzantine princess and a Viking chief. And it starts out, I think I, I, I gave a big long introduction, but I think we better will just get into it because the opening shot is kind of interesting. And I might give some background and feel like interrupting me at any point. And this is an experiment because I sort of realized we're, about the uh, positive parts of technology. I got that tablet that I bought to do chess problems with. And that tablet allows me to, to access a whole lifetime of creative work. And who knows, maybe there's a film producer or something who wants to buy the rights for the saga of e Igor and treat it like a desk play, uh, you know, something that you buy for an economic loss. I don't know about that. But, you know, like they say, hit your wagon to a star. Okay, Catherine. The Saga of Igor, Part 1 by Phil Caveney. Zeno, centurion of Emperor Basil's archer, cursed the name of his emperor under his breath, then double cursed the Emperor Basil for commanding him and his hundred archers, who peered through arrow slits in the Great Wall, to stand ready with their recurved bows fully drawn and their yard-long steel-tipped, poison-dipped arrows flush against their ears. All their aching shoulders, arms, and fingers screamed to release the shafts that would pierce the heart of the lumbering Viking warrior Igor, who stood a hundred paces before the great gate of Byzantium, roaring like a bull with flaming hemorrhoids. Igor roared in that horrible barbarian language that they called Norse, which was an affront to the sensitive ears of the Greeks who called themselves Romans that guarded the great city. Though Igor sounded like a raging bull, he looked more like a bear as he stumbled forward to assert his claim. Everyone gasped when he nearly dropped the shield, mallet, and the spike he carried in his hands, which were large as hands. Igor would now assert his claim for the emperor's daughter as his prize. Yet something was not as it should be. Igor could see that the gate was not made of gold silver and ivory as had been sung in fable rather it was made of nearly indestructible ironwood which would neither burn nor melt like iron or shatter like stone the great gate was ten times igor's height and made of black oak girded with belts of hammered iron the fire of a hundred sieges had scorched it but somehow the gate had always choked out the flames in the last 500 years since the the first Rome had fallen and Byzantium was proclaimed her heir, the second Rome. The great gate buckled, but was never breached. Like the empire protected, that was its greatest strength. All who tried to take the city, Scythians, Persians, Huns, and Arabs, to name only a few of them, left some of themselves at the gate, giving it a kind of ghastly chainmail. A flint, iron, copper, bronze, and steel arrow and steer points, spear points, which for some inexplicable reason did not tarnish as long as they stayed embedded in the great gate of St. Mark, but oxidized immediately or crumbled to powder if drawn out. As a grim reminder to those who test the gate, the semi-skeletal remains of those who most recently failed and were captured swung in iron cages and twisted gently in the wind, encrusted in black pitch to retain a kind of ghastly integrity. They were known as Basil's scarecrows. Eager stopped for an instant and thought, hmm, have I led a band of fools south for this? Did Ivan, that son of mine, lie to me to be rid of me to, to claim his patrimony while I still live? Is there no Princess Zoe? But Eager was not long allowed the luxury of reflection as the clamshell locket that he wore on the finely woven red Dane gold chain gifted him by the nuns of Angleterre as tribute 
for not ravishing their convent, bounced against the gray and red hair of his heaving chest. It burned with pale cold light against his huge pectorals. Eager felt a rush of fear cut through his heart. Perhaps she, Zoe, her image, was no longer inside the locket. His hands snapped open at secret class and he seemed to step out of time as the rest of the world waited in a single heartbeat for that lasted for eternity. For that instant, time ran subjectively and Eager was a thousand miles north, cast back in time to the start of his journey and he was lost inside the great whale's belly of a mead hall on the darkest day of winter. The mead hall shielded Igor and the Vikings from the northern darkness and the eternal winter, which lasted half the year. Igor knew the voices and one of them was his own. Then all the voices were lost in the moist smoke as it stalked like a snow leopard through the great whale's rib beams that supported the peat roof of the mead hall. Then Igor heard his own screaming voice cut through the smothering guts of the meat hall. He heard his own voice threatening his son Ivan with death over the locket that Igor now called his own. Ivan, if you will not sell me the locket, then I will kill you for it. Ivan, who was as tall and well-muscled and handsome as Igor was huge and ugly, gathered his strength to answer his hated father. Yet those who both of them said Ivan was no more beautiful than his father, eager 23 years before, when the great inconsolable sadness of Ivan's mother, Sylvia's death, befell him. Ivan answered, This locket is all I have of my time in Byzantium with Princess Zoe. You will never own it. You will never see her. You will never touch her. She is too white, too pure for your eyes, you bloated ox. But Igor did not have to fight or kill Ivan for the locket simply because he had no fear of his own death and neither the promise of heaven nor fear of hell could deny him what he wanted. Instead, he put his own dagger to his own throat and threatened his son with being the cause of his own father's suicide. This was an act which, if consummated, would lock the gates of Valhalla to both Igor and Ivan and co-signed them both to swim for eternity in the great ice-filled open sewer that encircled the walls of Valhalla. Now Igor was back into the present and Princess Zoe was still there inside the locket as Igor was dragged by the hand of time back down into his own history as he stood alone in front of the great gate. To his men watching, his hundred fools who he led south, who watched him from a small ridge safely outside of Byzantine bowshot. Igor looked like a tiny figure on the great plain that stretched to infinity. The walls of a city of over a million souls stretched to the periphery of the Vikings' vision. Byzantium knew not the Vikings, it seemed. Behind her walls that protected the harbor called the, the Great Horn Ships came and left every minute. It was as if the siege of Byzantium was only a drunken dream in the Vikings' mind. Mm -hmm. Ali, one of the spear carriers, spoke. Igor should be crushed like an ant. Why did the Byzantines fall back behind their walls? Another added. They could send out the Imperial Guard and arrest us. This city is larger than our kingdom. It rules the world. One more voice in the chorus continued. We are no more than an insect on their shin. The voice, that of Igor's captain, added, It must not have been our time to die. Then he continued, I hope Igor's heart does not fail. He is really far too old for this. He should be home fishing. Luckily, the last hundred paces were downhill, and Igor seemed to roll against the gate. From a secret window, Zoe looked down on Igor. She had never seen a man so ugly. His hair hung like a mane across his broad but sloping shoulders. There was nothing about him that spoke of royalty. She held a spyglass to her eyes. Now she could see the burrs in his matted red beard and scars from his scores of battle that covered his heavy body. His steel blue gray eyes, which were set and resolute with purpose. Then she thought of her father's words when she was implicated in his botched assassination 
when her latest lover, the prime minister, died sampling an eastern shellfish delicacy that was to cause the emperor to die in intractable pain in less than five minutes. Zoe was implicated as the prime minister rasped his eternal love for Zoe through his parched and purple dying lips. This was as close to the imperial purple of being empress that Zoe could get, as she remembered the calculated, almost celestial coldness in her father's voice only two previous days. Once too often you've tried to kill me, Zoe. I've had enough of you. I want you a thousand miles north of here. You will become the bride of Igor, emperor of the north. At this instant, he's coming south for you. If you refuse, you will f eat first at the next banquet and the empire will mourn you for saving your father's life. Better yet, perhaps you'll fall off the wall on one of your little midnight walks. As a grim reminder that Basil meant what he said, the bodies of all the co-conspirators, almost most coming from Zoe's private guards, some still living in various states of dismemberment, hung in cages not far from Zoe's and begged for death in pathetic voices. Zoe's mind was strangely not on them because they had failed her and not made her empress. Zoe's thoughts were on her present and grim future as she asked herself a series of questions since she knew Igor and Ivan were father and son. How could Ivan, the man who she had sent away from Basil's court five years before because she loved him so, be the son of Igor, the man who stood before the great gates of St. Mark? Zoe remembered Ivan's hands, his hair, his height, his eyes. She remembered how he'd, she had snatched him from the marshal of the empire who had bid even Ivan's weight in gold for the pleasure of knowing him in the biblical sense. She thought of his hands twice as large as hers and, how, and she thought of how quickly his hands learned to play the lyre. How easily he learned her language and taught her Norse in a way that sounded like a poem on the wind. He'd grown too close to her too quickly and one night she had him sent out of the city and home, home to save his life. Her words to him sliced across time. Take this small thing to remember me by. Into his hand she pressed her locket, shaped like a clamshell, opening with a hidden clasp and containing a perfect likeness of Zoe inside. It shone with a cold, precious light that would bring both fire and ice to Ivan's heart. Princess Zoe knew that she would never see I Ivan's son of Igor again, and she knew that every night of her life after their parting, she would be wolf-hungry for his touch. Now, the same locket that he had wrested from his son with a threat of suicide banged against Igor's chest as he rose to his feet, spike, shield, and mallet in hand. He, pres he pressed his forearm to hold the shield to the gate. The first blow glanced off the spike and smashed against Igor's finger. He roared as the men on, his <laughs> on the hill held their sides <laughs> laughing. Then it changed. Igor's hands were sure, his chest was deep, his balance steady. With three more blows, he drove the spike through the shield and into the wood iron and wood. Igor called out a challenge as he drove in the spike. I claim Zoe for my own. Give me what is mine or your city will be in ashes. A door appeared as if by magic next to the gate and the emperor's marshal stepped through. He was dressed in his full ceremonial armor and spoke to Igor in his own tongue. What is this disturbance, you northern ruffians? Why do you insult the summer day with your buffoonery? End of part one.